Hey guys, in today's episode, I have on Ina Braverman. She is CEO and founder of EcoWave Power, an Israel based company which uses its patented technology to harness sea wave power and turn it into green electricity. In today's episode, some of the things we talked about were how she started her company, women in entrepreneurship, finding passion, and much more. All right, let's get into it. So I'd like to get started. Um, I kind of just organically discovered your company, um, and I've always been fascinated with renewable energy. Uh, I went to school for engineering, um, in hopes of kind of figuring out where my place would be in that space. Um, and I always knew about the big ones, you know, we got solar, we got wind, uh, but I never knew about capturing wave power. Um, and then I did a little more research and I saw some of the big companies in the area and you actually founded one of those eco wave powers in 2011. Um, I'm really curious on entrepreneurs such as yourself and, you know, it's a very daunting thing starting a company, uh, nonetheless, uh, a hardware company, um, because it's hard to raise money. Um, and there's just a lot that can go wrong. So I'm really curious about um, not why you started the company, but why did you decide to start the company at that point in your life? Was it because you saw the the technology was at a point where this could be a viable product in the market or kind of, can you just walk me through your headspace in 2011, where you were at and why you thought this was the right time to jump in? So actually, uh, it wasn't all that simple and it didn't start in 2011. It kind of relates to my background story. Like I live in Israel and EcoWay Power was founded in Israel, but I was based, basically born in Ukraine. And uh, on the 11th of April, 1986, and uh, two weeks after I was born, the Chernobyl nuclear reactor exploded, which was the largest in history nuclear disaster. And uh, I was one of the babies that got hurt from the negative effects of the explosion. I actually had a respiratory arrest and a clinical death. And uh, luckily my mother, she's a nurse, uh, she came to my crib on time and she saw me already like blue and pale and not breathing. And she gave me a mouth to mouth resuscitation until the ambulance came and saved my life. So I can't remember any of it, I was a baby, but uh, I grew up with the feeling that, okay, I got a second chance in life and I should do something good with it, you know, because it's not like a regular story to hear from all your family at all the family dinners and uh, so on, that you got a second chance in life. And uh, when I was four years old, our family immigrated from the Ukraine to Israel. And we immigrated to a very, very small coastal city in Israel, in the north of Israel called Akko. And really growing up, Obviously, I didn't know words like renewable energy or startups or anything of this sort, sort because like the city was very you know, simple, very small. And uh, so I decided that the best way to maybe be able to change the world and do something good is through politics. So when I went to study in the university, uh, I studied political science and English language and literature. So I said, as a politician, for sure, I can change the world and do something good and, you know, and achieve good things. And when I finished my uh, first degree, my BA in political science, uh, there was no lineup of politicians that were looking to hire somebody fresh from the university. So I didn't really have a chance to go into the parliament and make all this amazing uh, legislation. Uh, so I started looking for a job. You know, you, you're in your 20s, you're fresh from the university, you need a job. And the first job that I found was uh, as a Hebrew English translator in a renewable energy company. And there I kind of discovered the whole world of renewable energy. I discovered about solar energy and wind energy and wave energy. And whereas I saw that wind energy and solar energy at that time were like packed with competitions, like there was nothing, almost nothing left to develop. You know, everything was developed and everybody were kind of fighting for the same piece of the same cake, right? For the same uh, generation quotas and the same feeding tariffs. And wave energy was something that all the scientists and the engineers, they really believed in it. But no matter how much money was invested by the largest companies in the world in terms of wave energy, no matter which great strategic partnership they had or how large were the electrical companies that tried to develop wave energy, nobody was successful. 
So, you know, I was back then 24 years old. I said, okay, I don't have the money. I don't have the technical background. I don't have the contacts. I'm from a very small town. They cannot do it. I can do it. <laughs> That's something that can only happen to you when you're 24, the innocence of uh, really, really believing. But, uh, and I started researching. I started going to online databases and uh, seeing like where all the other wave energy technologies fail. Like why all the attempts that have happened by that point didn't work. And I started thinking about ideas, you know, not in the technical really sphere, not like doing sketches and so on, because I couldn't, I'm not an engineer, but really seeing where others failed, what was the problems of uh, other technologies and how can we, can I make it better? So I came up with my own concepts and ideas and so on, but I really had nothing to do with it. And it's okay to build a power station, to do R&D, even to register a pattern, you need resources, you need people, you need money. And I didn't have it. So I put it kind of, I put the idea aside as unrealistic because great idea but I didn't have anything to do with it and then one day I went to a social event and uh, a guy came and sat next to me and he looked a bit like a hippie like you know with many many strings on his hands and yeah. like wearing ripped jeans <laughs> and he came and sat next to me and he looked at me and he told me what's your passion like who starts a conversation like that and I told him right away wave energy because I was just researching it and so excited about it. I really wanted to do it. And it turned out that the guy that sat next to me is a serial entrepreneur that did a number of very successful exits. His name is David Lev. And one, one of his investments after the exits was a surf hotel in Panama called Rancho Estero. So he was, he's not even an Israeli citizen. He was in a visit in Israel, but he was sitting in Panama when he purchased the hotel. And he was watching uh, the power of the waves and he thought to himself, there must be something better that you can do with the power of the waves other than like marine sports, surfing. So he also started thinking about wave energy and researching it in a completely different side of the world. So when I answered to his question, wave energy, it was like, whoa, you know, what are the chances that two people were thinking at different locations in the world about exactly the same thing? And that was kind of the beginning of uh, eco wave power. And then he invested the first $1 million into the company. And uh, then we were able to really do the first uh, wave pool testing and the first proof of concept before other investors, investors you know, joined and started uh, also supporting the company. Wow, that's quite a story from uh, <laughs> your like humble beginnings to where you just went to that conference and you sat next to the right guy. It's crazy to kind of hear that come full circle. Um, in terms of the hardware that's so fascinating to me because like I did electrical engineering. So like making an innovation is, I find really cool. I find like one of the hardest things to do um, because it's such a daunting task from the get go. Um, once you, you met this, I'm forgetting his name, David, you said it was his name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you met him, you know, he had, you were both researching it was the next kind of linear progression to think, let's draft up kind of like um, a minimum viable product and present that and get funding and then hire engineers to build out this concept idea or what were kind of the next steps? So both of us are not engineers. So obviously we couldn't keep uh, hiring the engineers to the next step. But uh, of course, we both had ideas, but we didn't know if our ideas would work, they wouldn't work, you know, again, we don't come from this world. And the hiring engineers at day one of a company or a day one that you have an idea is very, very expensive, right? Because you don't need just one, you need hydraulic and uh, mechanical and electrical and software and like you need a lot of things to actually plan or build the power station. So what I did in order to save money in the beginning of the company, I went back to the same city in Ukraine where I was born, where the, of course, the people are very smart, engineering-wise and mathematics and in these fields especially, but the salaries there are lower because of the, you know, that's how the country is. So we went there, we made a competition between 300 engineers and chose a team of five that actually can take our ideas from like a concept to really practical sketches and blueprints and everything. So then uh, they developed uh, from our idea, they really developed a more practical solution. And then we went to the next step, which was wave pool testing. We hired, uh, we rented the Hydromechanical Institute in Kiev, which is like a governmental institute that they have a lot of uh, wave pools and a lot of like testing tools for um, different uh, devices, marine devices. And we made uh, a test into the first like very small uh, concept of uh, our wave energy technology. We got a, an approval from the Institute for the Workability of Technology. 
and a recommendation to enhance it to a greater uh, scale and to also test it in real conditions because at the end of the day in a wave pool you can only test it to a certain extent and then what was really really important to us is really you know getting in the water like getting in real conditions because we saw that one of the main problems of companies that were again back then and even today in the wave energy sector is the fact that they devoted 10 years, sometimes 20 years, sometimes more to really theoretical research, just like doing simulations and testing and computer illustrations and so on. And nothing really compares to the power of mother nature, you know, to the power of the waves. So for us, it was really important, like as soon as possible to go into the water. And that's something that we did. And I think that it, it was really correct because we learned a lot from it. When you went in the water, did you, did you have that epiphany moment or rather when did you have that epiphany moment when you're like there's actually something here you know we've done the research we've hired the engineers we have a product when were you like oh we found the fit this is like a product market fit there's something that can really develop from this kind of just idea that we had so i think there there was not one epiphany moment throughout the lifespan of the company i think there were many of these moments uh, because you're developing a very complicated uh, project and all the time it's moving forward and being upgraded so the first moment was when it worked in a wave pool when we saw like that uh, we can actually harness electricity and uh, search we believe that we were testing different shapes of floaters and we saw that really different shapes are generating different amount of electricity even if the volume of the floaters is the same and then the second moment is when we put it in the in the water like we really built a pilot station and put it for the first time in real conditions and we saw that it does not have the major problems that the wave energy sector to that date suffered from because like most most of the competitors 99 percent of the companies they went into the offshore four or five kilometers into the sea and the problems they had is very high prices very low reliability a company called Pelamis broke down if i'm not wrong after three days of operation on the coastline of portugal having hundreds of millions of dollars sinking and total loss of the system because in the offshore you have waves of 20 meters and even higher yeah. insurance companies weren't agreeing to ensure this type of technology and environmentalists were kind of objecting the offshore technology because it created a new presence on the ocean floor so when we build the first like pilot let's call it which was off grid because we didn't have any approvals to connect to the grid of course so we saw that it's really cost efficient in the price in comparison like that people spend hundreds of millions and we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars which was a very big price gap uh, we didn't have breakability problem because we did a patented storm protection mechanism that when the waves are too high for the system to handle the floaters automatically lift above the water level and they stay in the upward position until the storm passes similar to a wind turbine when the wind blows too strong the turbine actually stops turning it locks down to prevent damage we were able to get insurance which was a very important moment for us we saw that the environmentalists are supporting us we got an award from the united nations the global climate action award now we're supported by the sustainable market initiative of prince charles and the world economic forum so like there were a lot of moments in 2016 was the first time that we connected to the grid with our gibraltar power station you know at that point people were saying okay you're not expensive and you don't break down but like if you're going to try to connect to the grid you're probably going to burn down the grid because nobody or almost nobody saw wave energy connecting to the grid safely they didn't know even if it's possible and then we didn't burn down the grid and everything worked properly so like every moment where people kind of doubted us or or the industry or people were scared and we were able to overcome was an epiphany moment it was like wow like i went for another obstacle like what's the next thing that i should achieve and still we have a lot of things ahead of us to achieve did you ever want to go further in the ocean to harness those higher waves the the, the stronger wave power or was it always from the get-go let's keep it closer to the shore and collect the um, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, lower power waves, but it's, you know, the machine won't break down. Like, how did you decide between going deeper and, and, and staying closer? So in the future, I definitely see the offshore wave energy market as a viable market. I do think that uh, wave energy from the offshore will be harnessed. Uh, at this time, uh, I don't believe that uh, it's the right time for that, because if you look at a comparable industry, if you look at wind energy sector, you see that the first 100 years from the first like onshore or on land wind turbine there were 100 years that passed until an offshore wind platform was actually built so they got 
100 years of experience of technical resources, of financial resources, until any wind developer actually went down and built the first offshore wind turbine in Denmark. So with wave energy, I don't know why, like the industry started overconfident. Right away, everybody went to the offshore where it's the most expensive, the most like difficult to insure, the most breaking down. It's not the correct way. Like we need to start where it's simple and possible. And then again, as we reinforce ourselves, we can go to harder energy generation zones, let's call it. So that's the reason why we also focus on the onshore and nearshore, which is breakwater, spears, jetties, and other types of existing structures. Because we saw it's, it's just there, it's not used for anything, it's super simple. We can prove to everybody that got like scared from the wave energy industry that it's not as expensive, that it does not break down, you know, that everything is fine. And then when we gain people's trust and support and people understand that wave energy is a very much viable source, not only theoretically, but also practically, then maybe in the future we can extend to other zones. So are you generating an, like um, a significant amount of power? Uh, I'm trying to just um, form this question in terms of funding. Like I assume you have venture capitalists come in and put money in with the potential that this will be a viable large business in the future. But are you also generating revenue from other um, applications of the business at this moment? So basically... Uh... Regarding the funding, we started really with investment from VC, uh, VC companies or investment funds. And currently the company is publicly traded. So we listed on uh, July 2019 on NASDAQ First North in Sweden. And in July 2021, so three months ago, we actually uh, dual listed the company to NASDAQ US. So currently we're publicly traded on NASDAQ US. And of course we raised funding in both times. Um, do we generate revenues? Yes, we started to generate some revenues, mostly right now from different uh, complementary services, engineering services, such as the feasibility studies that we do before we're starting to actually build uh, the power stations. Uh, the, the largest amount of revenues will come when the company actually reaches a phase which is called commercial rollout. So our uh, business model is basically not to sell the technology or sell the power stations themselves in turnkey solutions. Our business model is basically investing or co-investing in the installations in the power stations holding them on our balance sheet and making revenues for the lifespan of the technology which is expected to be 25 years so basically think like you're building an apartment building but you're not selling any of the apartments you're renting them for 25 years and you're making the revenues from the rent and you're holding the building on your balance sheet so this is the best way that we believe uh, that um, we can become profitable and reach a commercial rollout. And that's our plan, basically, to start with one commercial scale power station and then to start building many in parallel. Got you. Where are they located? Are they just in Israel or are they all over the world? So the first grid connected power station that we built is in Gibraltar, the one that I told you that we built in 2016. This is the first grid connected one. The second one that we're finishing the construction in a number of months is in Israel, it's uh, in collaboration and co-investment with the Israeli Energy Ministry. They invested 50%, and 50% is from EDF Renewables IL, which is a subsidiary of uh, Electricité de France, uh, the French National Electrical Company. Will open in a few months. And other than that, we have projects pipeline of 325 megawatts in different locations around the world, which are in different uh, development stages. Got you. Do you think in the future? Uh, wave power energy can be as big or bigger than solar power capture energy um, or wind power? Definitely. Uh, according to the World Energy Council, uh, wave energy can actually generate more than twice the amount of electricity that the world produces now. Only wave energy as a sole source. Uh, it also, it has an advantage that it's available in a special in suitable location, it can be available around the clock uh, because you know the sun, the solar energy is an amazing source, but then you have the night or cloud coverage or winter or pollution like in China where you cannot see the sun and then you don't produce any electricity. Wave energy is considered a much more stable source than wind and solar energy. But in the end of the day, although I'm not really objective, like I'm a big supporter of course of wave energy, I do think that the answer for climate change and for the pollution that is caused by the way that we currently generate our electricity and 80% of the world's electricity is generating, generated by fossil fuels, unfortunately, and by polluting sources, we need to combine all renewable energy sources together. It needs to be wind and wave and solar and tidal 
and any type of other technology, we really need to have a variety because if you look at different countries, you see each country has more of one resource available than the others, or it has one resource available during a certain season or a certain month or a certain time during the day. So if you really combine all of these sources together, we can really get a 100% environmentally friendly world. And this is what I think we should aspire for, because I really don't believe that wave energy and solar energy or wind energy or all the other sources, they compete. They don't compete. They're really complementary towards each other. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Kind of like it's like a pie and it's divided in thirds or maybe yeah. one's a little bit bigger than the other, depending yeah. on the, the weather demographic. Um, but that kind of gradual change from fossil fuels and nuclear to renewables um, is, is, it seems like it's taken off in the last five years, like just uh, at least notably. Um, I'm interested on your mindset when you were starting this company, I, I assume there's a lot of fear and kind of a lot of this, this feeling of like an imposter syndrome. I don't know. Have you ever experienced that because you had such humble beginnings and you're coming into this whole new world of startups and engineering, and there's just so many moving parts and pieces because you got to deal with the business and the engineering. Did you have moments? Um, and if you did, can you speak about them? where you were just like, oh, I think I bit off more than I can chew. This is like, this is, this is a lot. There's a lot to kind of learn. I don't know where this is going to be a year from now. Like those kind of moments of anxiety. Can you just talk about that? So of course, anxiety is always there when you're starting a new business. I don't think it matters what's your background or what's your age or, you know, who are you and what do you have? Like every time you start a new business or trying to develop a new product, you have anxiety. You're, you're a little bit scared. Like if something is not gonna work, if something is not gonna go as planned. So of course it's natural and it's normal. And I'm sure that even the, the big entrepreneurs like uh, Mark Zuckerberg or uh, Elon Musk had this moment in different uh, development uh, stages of their companies. Um, listen, I truly think that, and I always say that Passion is, in the end of the day, is the greatest renewable energy source. There's nothing that can, <laughs> you know, there's nothing that can damage your passion. If you're really passionate about something and you really believe in something, then you're going to push through the anxiety and push through the fears and push through everything and really make it happen. So I did have these moments. I even have these moments right now that something happened and I'm like, whoa, how am I going to deal with it? Like, this is not planned because unfortunately we don't plan all our you know careers or personal life or whatever happens to us but again when you believe you're doing something good for the world and you're doing the right thing and you're in the right field then it's not going to discourage you i'm curious because i've had this conversation with a lot of my friends who are kind of at the age when you ventured into this world around 24 mm -hmm. um and this conversation of choosing a path in life is so difficult because there's people that are like want to do everything and then there's people that don't know what to do. So this idea of passion, the way I look at it, seems to be different based on everyone's perception of that idea. Can you define what you think passion is? I think passion is really wanting to do something with every bit of your self. I, I, I don't know how to define it exactly. And being really, really persistent about it. Like not taking no for an answer because as an entrepreneur or as a developer of a new technology, uh, you hear a lot of no's, you hear a lot of maybe's, uh, you hear a lot of people that never call you back and you're super excited and you really hope for it. So I think it's really knowing that you're in the right place in the right time and not giving up no matter what happens. So I think that's kind of the definition of passion for me. Wow, that's a great definition. Um, when you were doing this, and, and you had this idea of this is my passion. Did any like I, other ideas, like I could be doing this, did those kind of like, kind of like mess with the idea of your passion? Because like, you were just like a hundred percent, like I'm, yeah. I'm researching this, I'm working at this company as a translator. Now I want to learn more about this. And you were just like, like a um, tunnel vision. You were just only focused on that. You didn't have any other like fighting so thoughts. It, it didn't happen at the time that I was working in another company. It happened when I opened when I opened my company, when I opened the Eco Wave Power together with David. That's, no, it's not an industry that you can have side thoughts. Like I, I got 
many different offers and can you help us with this and can you do this for us you know many people see that you do something really well so they want you to do that for their, their company as well but really when you're developing a new industry a new sector and you're feeling that you're doing something very innovative you know cutting edge revolutionary then you don't have the the brain space or the desire to do some something else you really want to do that can you imagine like so many people, so many companies have tried to do wave energy and nobody succeeded. And this little girl from a small town in Ukraine that almost died in Chernobyl is going to do it. So you really invest all your efforts because it's not a small mission just like developing like a pen or a small product, you know, that you can sell yeah. in the retail yeah. market. It's something big and you really need to be fully devoted to it to make it happen. So I, I don't think that I ever like sidetracked other adventures yeah you when you started in 2011 you were like this is my singular focus and i'm going to give it everything there that's fascinating that's really cool um and then you never go, have anything to be sorry about because if you know you gave your all to try to do something good then you'll never look back and say wow i could have done more you know because i really couldn't i did the maximum that i could yeah that that i think most people regret not trying something as opposed to regret doing something and failing. So uh, that's kind of like a, 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 a nerdy way that I put it, like a framework to think about when you're making decisions is like, I'm probably regret, I'm going to regret not trying this as opposed to if I did it and failed, you know what I mean? Like if I did it and it failed, at least I tried, you know what I mean? I can live with that. But if I didn't even try, I'm always going to wonder what if, like, like, and that, and I think that, go ahead. I think that many companies and large scale companies nowadays, they really encourage their employees, their engineers, their people to fail. Because when I went to a visit at Facebook headquarters in Paris, uh, one of the kind of key sentences that they had there, and I even saved one of the papers that had it written on it, it was fail harder. <laughs> so that was one of the sentences that they were encouraging their employees. So it shows that it's better to try and fail than not try at all. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, and I, I try to push my friends in that direction of just when you, because we have this conversation of passion a lot and I'm just like, I have an idea of what I'm passionate about, but those are really like intrinsic motivations. Um, and they're very selfish of me because it's just the outlook that I've seen the world through is my own eyes. But I want to change the wrongs that I've seen. So those motivate me. And then when I talk to other people, they're like, I don't have kind of thoughts like that. And I'm like, well, just try a bunch of different things and kind of see what sticks. You know what I mean? Throw yeah. things against the wall and figure out what you care about. And that's kind of a way to like find that elusive passion because a lot of people, at least that I'm, the circles I'm in, try one thing, and don't like it and they kind of just do average work and they've admitted to that and i think that's kind of like a like a poison almost because if you're doing really passionate work and you care about it so much and it's not about the the money or the the extrinsic things you can gain from that and you just care about it because it it, it self motivates you i think you're going to do better work over the long term then in the short term, burn out and, and, and try to get those extrinsic motivations, if that makes sense. Listen, I think that everybody gets their passion clear to them at a certain point in their life. Maybe some people discovered their passion when they're 12 years old, like look at Greta Thunberg that started uh, protesting against climate change when she was a kid. And some people get their passion when they're 50 or 60 years old. Uh, Jack Ma, I think he started his career at is one of the most successful entrepreneurs in, in the world, the founder of Alibaba. He was a school teacher before he founded Alibaba. So like he, he did different things uh, before he actually went ahead and started his entrepreneurial careers. So I think everybody fi finds their passion if they're lucky at a certain age. If they're not lucky, maybe they never find their passion at all. You know, maybe they just don't run across something or like just see something that they're really, really passionate and they really care about. And that's okay as well. Like, I think that everybody should do anything that makes them happy in, in the end of the day. And in your case, for example, if you're passionate about a lot of things, 
I'm sure that at a certain point it will narrow down. Maybe you'll try this thing and won't like it and try another thing and won't like it. And then you will find the, the last thing and you would really love it. And then you say, okay, that's my real passion. Yeah. But I really hope and wish for everyone to find their passion because it's a great feeling to wake up in the morning and knowing that you're doing something that you really, really want to do. Yeah, so, no, I agree. And I think I've been in jobs where I'm just like banging my head against the wall and I'm just like... I want it to end right now. And I'm not passionate about that. And uh, I kind of, uh, I reason by analogy. So I kind of think of it like with my dogs. I have two dogs and there's a backyard and they get up every day and they just want to chase the squirrel in the backyard. So every day they wake up, they know what their goal is. They know what their passion is. It's to get that squirrel. And then by the end of the day, they're tired of running around because this squirrel is smart. He'll go up a tree. He, he, he knows. I think he just messes with them at this point. <laughs> and he, they're chasing him with no care in the world, but get that squirrel off their lawn. And then they come home at the end of the day and they're tired. They go to bed and they wake up in the morning and they're ready to go get that squirrel. And they have their passion. And I had another dog who passed away and she was kind of more like an indoor dog. And she would just sleep most of the day. I didn't, she didn't have a passion. And I never knew that until I saw these other, my other dogs have a passion. And it was like, there's this spark. They have something to live for. So I, I take that kind of analogy and I, I kind of apply it to humans. If you don't have a passion, you're kind of just going through the motions of life, but you're not living. You know what I mean? And if you have, maybe it's starting a family. It could be whatever your passion is. It could really vary. But if you have like a business like you do, that's kind of your baby. You know what I mean? That's you're given that everything and you're going to do better work because you care about it. And I, I've, I've talked to some entrepreneurs and they're always looking for, not they're always, but some of these are looking for an out. Like they're like, well, I'm going to do this. And then I'm looking for this exit. And I'm like, I don't know if you're really going to be successful, just in my opinion, because it's like, you want an exit. You like want to be acquired or something. And I'm like, maybe you might survive, but probably not. Like it's going to be really hard. Like I assume I, I study a lot about entrepreneurship because it's just a hobby that's maybe turning into a passion for me, but I, I just like it. Like, I think business is like the coolest way. Like you were talking about politics and making change. And I live by like the Washington DC area. Mm -hmm. That's where my family's from. And I see a lot of people go into politics and then I see a lot of them, their hair turns gray, they start losing hair and they're just like not making the change that they hoped because they went into politics. And then I listened to like entrepreneurs and I, I started learning about the, that world kind of like a year ago and actually a lot through this podcast. Um, and it's like, those people sound so passionate every day and they're actually helping people, you know what I mean? And they might, their goal maybe not was to like uh, specifically help this group of people, but because they were trying to help this other group of people, it, it had this effect to help this other group of people. And I'm like, whoa, I've lived in this area where politics was kind of how you make change. And the more I'm hearing about those stories, it doesn't seem like they're making change there. But when you're starting a business, at least right now, to me, my understanding is, that's making an impactful change. You know, you're affecting the world more than if you had gone into politics, probably, I suspect. Do you kind of feel that way? Listen, I think that in the end of the day, you can make a change and you can make an impact doing almost everything. It's how much you care about it and, you know, different uh, variables. So I do think that a politician that comes with a very clean heart and clean intentions into politics and really wants to do something good for his people, for you know, the general public, I think he can make a change. You know, he will struggle to make a change because there may be forces that are acting against such change. Maybe there are people that are afraid of the change. Maybe that's what's creating the gray hair uh, in the process. But uh, Again, I don't think that one sector is better than the other. I don't think that business is better than politics or politics is better than opening a little store. If that's your dream, opening a little store that sells, I don't know, vases or something like that. It doesn't matter yeah. really what, because as long as you're doing something that you like, and maybe and through that you make other people happy, you feel good with yourself, like you're living your life to the fullest, then 
everything counts. Like there's no one thing that is bigger than the other. And regarding your friends that you said with the, that are looking at, that are opening businesses in the hope or in the kind of aspiration for a very fast exit or making money, that is something that I do agree with because I think that in the end of the day, money is just means to get somewhere. Like you cannot develop a product, you cannot open a company, you cannot pay salaries, unfortunately, without having the funding available. But money should never be the goal when you're opening the business. You shouldn't be sitting there and saying, okay, how do I develop a product to make the most money possible? No, how do I develop a product to help this over there? Of overwhelming problem or this big problem and then use the funding that I have available to me to make it better and better and create more impact and then I think like the business is really valuable and you feel good with yourself and I think that when you're really again passionate about what you're doing and using money as means then most likely you will be successful because you're much more persistent you're much more like devoting your energy and your time and like everything that you have to that business and it's very difficult unless like you're super unlucky or something very unexpected happens. Like when you put that much energy into something, I believe it's very difficult to fail. Yeah. Yeah. That, those are all great points. Uh, if you were looking, or if you were talking to 24, 24 year old Ina, what advice would you give her? You know, like looking back on it, like, do you have any things that you've learned because I'm just so in awe of, of people that start businesses. And then you like, there's a lot of people here that start software businesses because it scales fast, uh, low overhead. And I, I think, you yeah, know, that's impressive. Don't get me wrong. That's cool. But when you're doing a hardware business, it's kind of like next level in my head in terms of appreciation, because that is like a lot tougher uh, because you have to develop the software and the interfaces, but then you also have to develop the hardware. So there's this kind of balancing act and there's less money in that area. Do you have any, so you've seen a lot. You've, I'm sure you've been through a lot, a lot of stressful situations. What advice would you give 24 year old Ina? Just, I think, believe more in myself, trust my instincts more, because for example, there were occasions that, uh, you know, I hired engineers and they showed me some sketches of something that we're planning to implement. And although I'm not an engineer, you know, I had already enough experience uh, as the founder of the company to see that, I don't know, something is wrong, like something doesn't look strong enough or, you know, designed well enough. And, and I would tell them this and they would say, but how do you know you're not even an engineer? Like, how can you tell this to us? And I would go to myself, yeah, really, I'm not an engineer. So probably they're right. They're much, I'm 24, they're 50. They have so many years of experience. And then when we would actually put the thing in the water, something would actually fail or not work as planned. And it, it was exactly the part that I had the instinct about. So I doubted myself because, you know, I was looking more at external criteria, yeah. like their age and their technical experience rather than trusting my instincts. And that's something that I would recommend myself not to do. And I learned with time to trust my instincts more than everything. And I think also because the energy sector is a very, let's call it masculine uh, sector, like uh, about only, according to a study by Ernest Young, only 5% of the executives in the energy sector are women, 5%, so 95% are men. And so most of the times when I, you know, would come to a conference room about to present our exciting technology, people would look at me like, coffee please like if there's a woman <laughs> in the room she's probably there as somebody's assistant because they don't see not from bad intention but they don't see women in the energy sector so it kind of takes your spirits down when you're coming there to present it wouldn't happen to a man that is coming to present this technology and people are ordering drinks yeah. so it would kind of make me feel a bit like uncomfortable or like i'm a mi minority in the room you know one time i went to a conference i think it was in london and uh there was a room and I was the only woman in the room. So the host actually saw it and he said, Ina, can you please not tell anybody that, that this happened and not, don't take any pictures. <laughs> so maybe also like um, see the fact that I'm a female in a men's world, the energy world, which is unfortunately right now a men's world, uh, see it as a, as a positive and have more confidence about that as well. Does that kind of give you like a chip on your shoulder that you're a minority in that world? that like, I need to work harder or smarter to kind of prove yourself? First of all, yes, in a way, because you need to know your material 
the best, you know, if somebody else had to prepare an hour, maybe I needed to prepare five hours because like people are not used to a woman again in this sector. So like if she's making a mistake, ah, we knew she shouldn't be here. You know, so maybe you have this kind of concern that uh, you will justify any of their concerns or, or their what they're thinking about you. But in the end of the day, I think that I'm very, like the two subjects that I'm the most passionate about right now is really wave energy, renewable energy, because it's changing the world and really female entrepreneurship. Uh, I really, really promote women to go more into the STEM sector, which is science, technology, engineering, mathematics, because there's not enough women. There's also not enough women in VC venture capital. Only 3% of the venture capital partners in the world are women. And 99 or 98% of the funding in the world is going to female founders. Uh, sorry, only 2% are going to female founders. 98% is going to male founders of all the VC capital in the world. Mm -hmm. So like I really put it from my personal experience, I really put it as a, something high on my agenda to promote female entrepreneurship. I even take interns every year from different countries around the world, female interns, sometimes also male interns, but female interns in the regard to give them the tools of how to, you know, have more confidence, even if you are the only woman in the room and how to push things forward. And I would really hope to see that my work doesn't only impact our, you know, renewable energy variety, but also impacts women around the world into believing that, you know, Again, if you even if you're the only woman in the room, you can make a change and you can be heard and you can have a voice. Yeah, I don't know much about female entrepreneurship, but I do know something about being a minority in a country. So I, I can I can relate to that mindset of having a chip on your shoulder. Um, and for the longest time, I didn't know I was a minority just because you're a kid and you're innocent and you don't think about those things. And then the older you get, you start seeing these biases or you start hearing about them. I think I started hearing about them before I even registered them because they were so subtle. You know what I mean? It wasn't like until I got older, very apparent. Um, I'm curious on uh, female entrepreneurship. Why do you think that the numbers are so low? Do you think that it's because women are afraid to go in those fields? Or do you think it's kind of like a bias or a barrier to entry preventing them from coming in? I think the problem comes from both sides. On the one hand, there are barriers that are preventing them from coming in. Uh, for example, there's a famous um, event that happened here in Israel where uh, the counselor of Germany uh, came for a visit and she wanted to meet, she requested the government of Israel to meet the entrepreneurial scene of Israel. And there's a lot of bright women and bright men that are entrepreneurs in Israel, it's the startup nation. And they made a very nice uh, event for her in Tel Aviv Museum and uh, invited entrepreneurs and they invited only male entrepreneurs. Not one woman was, invite, woman was invited to the event. And she's a woman, it's Angela Merkel. So she came there and she looked at the situation. I guess she was shocked and she just said, wow, I guess Israel is not advanced enough to have women in the as part of the entrepreneurial scene of the country. And the government of Israel was really embarrassed. It was on the news like for a very long time. Uh, you know, um, newspapers, leading newspapers in Israel photoshopped like leading women into that picture that was taken from the museum without one woman at all. So like the, it, it created a very big noise, but that shows one side of the problem where, where women are just not invited to take part. You know, they didn't know about the event. They weren't invited to the event. There's nothing they could have done about it. But on the other hand, also maybe from this kind of cases, maybe from the way that we were brought up, also sometimes women do not have the confidence that is necessary to kind of, you know, fight for their place or, be where they need to be. It was like there's a famous study by Hewlett Packard that uh, they showed that when uh, a woman and a man apply for a job, they apply completely differently. So a man would apply when he's meeting 60% of the criteria for the job. So like he doesn't care that he's not meeting the other 40%, he's gonna apply anyway. A woman will apply only when she meets 100% of the criteria. So if she's not perfect, she's not going there. Oh, which is very, very strange way of thinking because you don't have to be perfect to be an entrepreneur. You don't have to be perfect to be anything. Like nobody expects us to be perfect. We're humans, we're not robots. So I also think that there's a need uh, to change the way of thinking. Also, there's a problem with uh, talking about money. Again, I don't know if it's the way that women, some women were raised, but like it's proven that when a male entrepreneur, let's say he wants to open a new business, 
and he needs $1 million, then he's going to go to the investors and he's going to pitch that he needs $5 million because he knows that, okay, he might have problems, the product development might not go as planned and so on. And a woman, when she actually needs $1 million, like she made her calculation, she was super accurate, she will request for $200,000 because she's saying, no, first I have to prove myself. So I'm going to ask like as little as possible and then go get more money. So they feel also, we feel sometimes, I guess, as women, uh, less comfortable to speak about money. And that's something that doesn't go well with business and entrepreneurship. Yeah, that's crazy. I wonder where that starts from. Like going back to that first point where guys, if they're 60% qualified, apply, and then women, unless they're 100%, don't apply. I wonder where that mindset came from because I'm thinking like, at least here in the States, the way I grew up, my mother owns her own business. So like single mother, like she's done everything herself. Um, so I've always, I never had this idea of looking at women differently, to be honest. So when I was in school, I grew up and I'd see girls. I was very introverted growing up, but I'd see, you know, girls being extroverted, learning the same things as guys. So I always had this imagination because I've never been in some of those, those worlds and, and what you've seen. I always thought they're equal, you know what I mean? Because they're raised the same way. I don't know at home how it went down, but at school, at least they're kind of raised the same way. Do you have any ideas on like where this mindset kind of, do you think it came from the household? Because they weren't born with this mindset. Like where did they develop this? I have to be perfect to apply for this job or I have to ask for a little bit less money. So maybe, and again, maybe it comes from the household, maybe it comes from the society around us, maybe it comes from like working for places and seeing that the whole management or the whole board of directors of your company are only men, so you don't think that you really have the opportunity to move up the ladder and to get to a more senior position in the company. I think it can stem from different uh, reasons, you know, depending on the character of the spe each specific wo woman and what influences her. So, so I think it's, it's both internal on how do you interpret situations that you see, or how do you interpret being like, again, the only woman in the room, do you take it to a positive place, do you take it to a negative place? And uh, on the other hand, it's also how the society treats us in a way. So like, again, if you're not invited, you can be the smartest girl in the room, but like you don't have a voice, nobody can hear what you have to say. So that, that's a problem. Yeah. That is a big problem. I'm curious, what is the the startup scene like in Israel? I hear like just anecdotes of it, you know, um, becoming a lot bigger. Um, I'm not really sure. You're actually the first person I've ever talked to from Israel. Um, I'm not well traveled, so this is uh, pretty cool for me. What is it? What is it like in Israel? So Israel, as I said, is considered the startup nation of the world. I think we have the most startups per capita in the world. Like everybody wants to have a startup. Like I have a friend that is not Israeli, but every time he, every time he comes for a visit and he takes a taxi, he goes to meet the taxi driver, tries to sell me his new startup idea. Like he never saw so many people pitching in so many different and weird places. So yes, everybody here are very entrepreneurial, very confident, both men and women. I think the country really pushes for entrepreneurship because I think the fact that Israel was kind of located and still located in a place that does not have a lot of like natural resources, like made the country to be forced or the people of the country to be forced to develop creative solutions. For example, like we have a big shortage of water. So that's why Israel developed a lot of desalination solutions. If we had a lot of water, we didn't even need to think about it. Or for example, uh, we have one of the biggest diamond uh, stock exchanges in the world. Like the best diamonds are considered that they're coming from Israel, but not one diamond was ever found in Israel. So maybe the fact that we have none makes us develop kind of the technology to do it. Plus we're really located in a very, how would I say gently, strained location pol politically. Like not all the neighbors around us really favor our uh, presence. And I think that also living in a condition where you don't know what will happen tomorrow in a way, like we're a very strong country and we have a strong army, but still like when your neighbors or most of them are kind of against you and you're the only democracy in the Middle East. And like many times we have different uh, political clashes or, you know, other type of clashes. So people live here like it's their last day in their feeling, you know, it's like, oh, I have to do it today because I don't know what will happen tomorrow. So this kind of uh, qualities have developed among people, which I also think that really helps the entrepreneurial feeling. Wow. That's so cool. I love that. It reminds me of 
in America, I feel like this is like Silicon Valley. Like the way you're talking about Israel is how I imagine Silicon Valley, well, how Silicon Valley is talked about. I don't know, after COVID, a lot of people dispersed throughout the country, but how they're talking pre-pandemic about that area. If you want to do entrepreneurship in America, that's probably where you need to be because that's where the like-minded people are. That's really cool. Well, something new I'm trying to do at the end of my podcast is ask my guests what they're most grateful for. Um, it doesn't have to be, you can take it however you like. So you can be in the moment or you can be in general. Uh, I just find it fascinating. I was also toying with the idea of asking what they're most motivated by, but this conversation has made it very clear what you're motivated by. So let's go with grateful. Um, and yeah. So I kind of think that for everything that happened to me in my life, because uh, listen, I really had, and I'm still having very special moments, very special experiences. I was lucky enough to meet my business partner when I was 24, which enabled me to kind of pursue my dream. Uh, you know, sometimes, I don't know, there's the moment that when I got the United Nations Award in, the, in 2019, again, what was the chances for a girl from a super small town in Ukraine and then an immigrant to Israel, again, to a super small, a super small town in Israel, what is the chance to stand on the United Nations stage and actually get an award? You know, so I think that many things that are happening to me are not really obvious, you know, because I did start, you know, in Texas Holden, the worst starting hand in the game is having a two and a seven. These are the cards that you have the lowest chances to win a Texas Holder, Holden match. So I kind of did start my life with a two and a seven, you know, no technical background, not, not from a wealthy family, from a you know, family of immigrants, like not having the right connections, starting with also bad in terms of the health problems that uh, I suffered because of the problem in the region. So I did start my life with the two and the seven. So every time I achieve something, I'm really, really grateful for it. Yeah, you got to play the cards you're dealt and they're not always fair. Uh, and no, I, I, if, I, if you have a full house, the two and the seven is our good card. If you have <laughs> the proper cards on the board. Yeah, not everyone's starting at the same point, but it's kind of how you play those cards you're dealt. Uh, and you've done a phenomenal job. Um, to go from where your story was in, in Ukraine to coming here and starting this whole venture. And with time, I think this, I think it's a great idea and I think it's super cool. Um, and I, I want to see this be one big sector in renewables. So props to you for being so self-made and, you know, having that confidence to keep pushing when there's a lot of obstacles in your way, whether it's technical or political, you're just, you know, grinding away and, and you got a smile on your face. That's, uh, I love to see that. that that's amazing. Um, well, thank you for your time. I appreciate you coming on the show. Is there anything you want to plug before I stop recording? No, I think we're good. I think you did an amazing job with the questions. Thank you, you asked me one of the most creative uh, questions that I've ever been asked in a podcast or an interview. So that's nice. Oh, which one was that? A lot, a lot, like how you connected between the questions and the dots and like you really touched a lot of subjects. So I, re I really enjoyed the interview with you. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, you know, I sent you those questions that I was going to ask because guests ask me that sometimes. And I'm like, I come up with questions always, but I'm like, it's so hard to like have an organic conversation that doesn't come off like me being, Larry King or a broadcaster and just asking you questions because it's like, I'm not engaged then. I'm like asking you questions. So the way my brain works is I have to like, just go naturally. Like I have to go off the cuff and just, because I want to have a flowing, like I want to have an open dialogue. Like I started this podcast to learn from other people, um, people that I find really fascinating and I having a good conversation is a podcast, you know? Uh, and that's all what I always set out to do. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, as soon as you finish the editing, I guess uh, you can send us the links to the podcast and we'll be glad to share it in, uh, on our website and our social media and to promote it a little bit. So let us know. Of course I will. Thank you.